Greetings, and welcome to the Open-Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland, and I'm your host. Today on our podcast, I will be sharing some highlights from an interview I did with Beth Darlington of Access Paranormal last June. Beth is a lively and passionate paranormal investigator. Her ambition is to provide relevant and actionable educational information for paranormal investigators around the globe through online learning. With her own story starting out like many others, finding information about hauntings is easy enough, but then what? Beth has training and development qualifications, as well as being a mental health first aider, a student of the School of Parapsychology, and with over 10 years investigation experience. Beth also enjoys traveling around the world, speaking at paranormal conferences, most recently at Scarefest in Kentucky, that's the USA, and as part of a panel at Skepticon in Sydney. Let's do this. So, um, what is the strangest? Yeah, <laughs> what is the strangest paranormal case you've ever dealt with, or you've heard another investigator have to deal with? That you know, high strangeness. I suppose I'm asking about. Oh, see, there's nothing. I mean, we're, we're talking about the afterlife, so it's like, what's what's extra strange? <laughs> what is it strange? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're talking about the people who yeah. passed on. Um, I would have to say those. There's been two cases where I've had to refer them to somebody who knows more about um, sort of the spiritual side of things. Because often when I get a case inquiry that comes in, I actually do my interviewing back to front. So I actually ask them what result do they want first, and then I can find out. They'll, they'll often say, "Well, I've got something in my home and I want it gone." I'm like, "Well, I don't do spirit clearings, so I can refer you to somebody." Or I just want to know what's there. Okay, maybe I can help you. So I actually kind of almost do it back to front. And uh, one person had said, "Look, I've got, I've, I've got, you know, a demon in my home. I know it." I'm like, "Okay, well, this is a level of seriousness I can't personally um, take on my own. I'm going to have to get somebody in um, to also help investigate what gave you that impression." And there were things like, um, she said she smelled sulphur, and she had the three scratches thing. And there's there's actually like a lot of common things people will mention about demonic cases that I honestly think Hollywood has more influence than the actualness of reality. Um, mm. I, I, it, again, there are certain questions you can ask that can indicate whether or not there's possibility of somebody not really telling the truth. It sounds silly. But, you know, uh, lies are harder to remember. The truth is easier to remember. So sometimes asking the same question but said in a different way, if you're getting different answers completely, then things aren't kosher. So that can also be a bit of detection as well. But this person was very much about, no, nah, it's demonic, no, nah, it's demonic. I'm like, look, okay, I'm going to have to get someone in uh, with me. Um, but I had a funny feeling that it wasn't that. I, I, I personally thought it would have been something to do with mental illness. Um, the person I brought on board, I was very, very spiritual person, um, does a lot of house clearings apparently and, and is very uh, confident in that. Um, and they said that whatever was there was, it was, it was almost like a manifestation from that person. Uh, so it was almost yeah. like, you know, it's almost like feeding, feeding whatever was there. It's, it's, he said something was there, but it was not a, a demon. It was, she was almost her negativity that it was, it was always growing from, you know, it's almost like that human battery thing that we were talking about, you know, it's almost a yes. cycle, a bit of a negative yeah. cycle. And that was very strange. I'd never thought of it really in that way. We always think about entities being created, you know, from, from someone who's passed over, but we can almost create our own entities just from intention and, and focus. Um, and that's the first I've ever really come across a case where it was actually something like that, but from a very negative uh, situation, you know, from, from what she was living in, very stressed. Do you use technology to prove and or disprove a haunting? And if so, what kind of equipment and where does a paranormal investigator purchase such wares? If you had to make a list of basic equipment for a, a newbie, um, what would you have included in that? So, 
what would you like to start with (laughs) um i will say so um what equipment do i use to try and detect possible paranormal activity i personally try to use as little as possible i'm a little bit on the old school side of it um i think you only need a few items Uh, the detection equipment i use is more about the changes in the environment as opposed to trying to detect if there's a spirit entity there, because we don't really know. We don't really know what they're made up of. We can sense and feel. I mean, I felt static a few times um, when I felt something nearby. I don't know if it was that, but it, for me at the time, it felt that way. Um, and of course, you know, there are there are detectors that are static detectors because people have obviously had those same experiences too. Um, so for generally for me, I tend to really kind of strip it back and I may have uh, what we call a MEL meter, which is literally just an EMF detector, detecting fluctuations of EMF in the environment. The general theory around using that is the fact that we actually have our own bio EMF. Mind you, it is minute. It's so small. Um, you know, you could put this mm-hmm. meter next to you and you won't get any readings, of, of course, at all. But of, there is the theory that, of course, once we pass over, where does this energy go? And that's when you start to look at this whole physics side of thing, you know, the law of thermodynamics and things like that. But we have to be very careful because, you know, energy can dissipate as well. It just takes time. So but yeah, all little things like that. That's that's the general uh, reason why people use EMF detectors. But I still have one just in case Um, high levels of EMF can actually affect the body and giving um, sort of feelings of being watched, um, feeling paranoid. So if I'm in a location and people are sensing that, I've got a device that's going to at least give me a reading as to what the levels are um, and whether that could be actually affecting them on a natural level as opposed to a possible spirit entity. Would you tell us a little bit about your client interview process prior to an in-home investigation and how you handle obvious cases of mental or drug-related problems with clients? Well, that's a good thing, the drug-related stuff, because mm. there was a, you know, there's a lot of people when they, they're, they're into alcohol and drugs and they get a Ouija board and they have a bit of fun, <laughs> you know, that was kind of a thing you did in the night. 90s, you know, you had, had a weird yeah. keyboard, you got drunk, and you had a, you played a few games. So, and um, I've, I have a friend who works for Port City Paranormal over in the states, and she is um, she's very pro the Ouija board, but I know her husband is very against it, and he thinks that's the way that a lot of negative or demonic entities enter our realm. What do you think? Well, well, lots of lovely bits of questions in there. Um, I know. (laughs) It's so good. I love it. Meaty questions are great. Um, Okay, so about um, interviewing process, um, I often uh, usually, if if the query comes through via email, I will then shoot um, an email back asking for a little bit more information. If it seems a bit legit in the sense where it's like, okay, we think, I think this could actually be something, I'll then actually suggest that I actually call them. So I then have what I've got is a phone interview form and it to someone, they might look at it and think I'm, you know, sort of losing my mind because the way it looks is I've got question one, seven, 14, 26. It's just all random numbers next to these questions. And what I've done is I've actually shortened down the actual face to face interview sheet and why I've numbered them and, and kept those numbers is that I can actually track what the person is saying each and every time I ask that question. So then I can find out whether or not they're actually telling me the truth. So that's a bit of a truth detected thing. So I, I, I shortened down my, my face-to-face interview um, for, the, for the phone one. So I get a bit of an idea. I get a bit more uh, sort of context around what's happening. Um, I also try and find out more whether or not they are actually open to me I'm helping explain naturally how things are happening. If they're not going to be, then I can actually say, look, that's wonderful. Um, I'm not the investigator for you, um, but I can put you through to someone who is. For me, they have to be at least open minded to rational thoughts on how some of this activity could be going on that could be explained. You know, some people are just like, all I want it is for, to be explained. I don't want my place to be haunted. So there are mm-hmm. people that are really happy to hear that. And sometimes there are people who aren't. And you don't want to go into a case trying to help them and, and you know, sort of find possible alternative explanations for them. And they're just not ready from the beginning, you know, the get go. So, um, I then obviously after that, I will then um, want to go and meet them. I think you get a lot from meeting somebody face to face. 
I never go on my own. I always have somebody with me. And by this Good. point, I've already, yeah, I always engage with another group by the time it gets to this stage. I'll be like, all right, who wants to take on a case with me? I've got this going on. And, and it can often be if, if I feel like it's a more shamanic thing. I know teams that just focus on that. So I'll, I'll pull that team in. Or if it's more of a, you know, trying to detect what's happening, I'll, you know, more of a sort of a paranormal equipment centered team, I'll, I'll pull them in instead. So, you know, that's where it starts to become uh, where I feel like I learn so much is because I learn different facets of investigating and yeah I we will go usually it's two or three to three of us that will go and sit down and have a chat and again as you know there are times where you know I'll, I'll actually look and think no I'm not going to proceed with this case I think we've pretty much managed to explain a lot of what's been happening and, and it's not paranormal um, but there are times where mm. it's like yeah it, it's rare very rare that we'll actually go to that next stage and actually go through with a full investigation and again it's not just the one time so a lot mm. of teams will look at going, well, I'm just going to investigate this case. They do one one overnighter. You know, it might go from, say, five in the evening or sort of four in the afternoon up until maybe two in the morning. And then they gather all their information and they present it like that's, you know, spirit ain't going to turn up in a you know a 12 hour period. It's, if it's going to be there, it's going to take, it's really, it, it, you know, it it's not going to be there in that time slot it may not ever be there in that time slot you need to do it repeatedly and you need to be around those people more and and the environment as well um cases generally should take about six months if they're done properly if there are investigators that turn around and say i've been i've had you know in my 30 years i've dealt with you know 500 cases no you haven't you've dealt with 500 emails you actually haven't gone through the whole process <laughs> so it's just and, and they need to be thoroughly done too but you need to to filter through the ones that are worth um, investigating. And it doesn't mean from an activity perspective, but it means the legitimacy of the activity. It, you know, most of the time it's not rock your socks off Amityville Horror House, which is fine. Um, mm. But there are some cases where they can be quite active. Um, but yeah, generally that's how it is. And we'll go through and, and it is done. I usually try to investigate once a month over six months at least to get a bit of an idea what's going on. And obviously you're putting somebody out of their home you know, um, mm. you know, it's uncomfortable having strangers there hooking up equipment and, and peeking in through your home. It's, you know, it's your safe haven. But by the time it gets to that, these people want answers and they and they generally are quite happy for, to at least having progress in that direction as well. So generally, that's how my interviewing stuff goes. Um, I can't remember those lovely other bits of questions that you had before. Oh, yeah, I'm having a bit of a, a blonde moment here, too. Sheila, do you remember <laughs> what the last question was? <laughs> I think it was something sorry, about Ouija sorry, boards Sharon, and that. I, I'd oh, that. that's right. That was something about Ouija boards. Yes, I'll let you go with that's that. That's right. I, oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, um, as I was talking about Port, Port City Paranormal, who are columnists inside magazine, um, um, Jane is very pro the Ouija board and her husband, Doug, is very anti it. So do you... Do you um, and we were talking about how um, some of your clients, it's probably obvious because you've done mental health first aid, of course, you can obviously spot somebody who's a little drug related or mentally unsure. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of the articles Doug's written on the Ouija board and why no one should ever touch it with a barge pole, um, which is it's quite... Um, which has made me very nervous about Ouija boards as well. Is do you do you believe do you believe that they are a path from for demons to enter our realm? Oh, absolutely! No, I'm joking. I am joking. <laughs> <laughs> I am joking. That's not to to sort of you know mock anybody who does hold that belief. It's um, I've I've used a Ouija board more times than I've got hands and toes. I have never had a problem. Um, I I I think it's very much about intention. Um, I think it's very much about confirmation bias as well. I think sometimes if you're going into it thinking something negative is going to happen, something happens that would appear to be negative is going to be, you know, reinforcing that that belief. Um, I like you said, you know, it's the, you know, have a few drinks, let's let's whack out the Ouija board, and you know, it's, yeah. it's a game play kind of stuff. It is, it's a popular thing, and then you know, people are very laxy and laxadozal and sort of, yeah, whatever, and you know, they're going to have a great time, and then you know, the, the board flies up, hits someone in the face, someone gets stabbed, and you know, it's all over. So, um, I think it really is down to uh, people's intention. I've, like I said, I I have no fear in using one. Um, I. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with them at all, personally, myself. But again, I don't recommend people who to use them if they don't feel safe. 
And I would, it's yeah. like, you know, I wouldn't recommend someone walk into a building if they don't feel safe. You've got to trust your instinct. You've got to trust yourself. If you don't, if you don't feel comfortable doing it, then don't. And there have been uh, paranormal events that I've been a part of where they will, they've got permission from the location to use one because most of them don't actually give you permission. Um, mm. Some of them will just still hold that belief. They don't want anything there or, or that negativity um, being associated with their location. But the some that mm. do, um, there are people that, you know, we will often say, you know, you don't have to join in if you don't want to be a part of this particular session. Uh, we've got something else happening over on the other side of the building or the other part of the location. And there will be people that will refuse to do it still. So, But I, I personally don't have any issue with them whatsoever. Um, I, I, most of it's just garbled nonsense that comes through. I think it's just energies flitting through. Um, they've just got as much, you know, spelling ability as I do probably as well. So <laughs> it just, just oh, flies look, through and that's it. Every time... I used to attempt it, you know, with at the end of a dinner party in the 90s, you know, we'd always end up arguing and telling and accusing someone of pushing the, what is it, the flagellet, the or, flagellet. is that what it was called, the flagellet <laughs> around, and that, that would be, the, and then everyone would go, you know, say, don't push it, and it would always be a boy, it would always be a man that did the, you know, and he just, couldn't take it seriously you know <laughs> and so I I don't think we ever actually got a message but um I've had other friends that did it and they've had glasses break and stuff the yeah, glass I've had the glass yeah you yeah had I've that. had that before yeah, yeah I've had I've had glasses um one was in England I was talking about this at a book launch um about a month or two ago um about you know we talk about experiences in this book that um I was able to contribute some experiences to and one of them was um, the, the planchette was actually an upside down glass. And I was in England at the time and it, it was going around the board so fast in a very in a clockwise direction, really fast. And then suddenly flew off the table and the glass smashed in midair. Um, and that was interesting because it was, um, you know, to have that happen once yeah. was incredible, but it ended up having th happening three times that night. So we ran out of glasses. <laughs> Is there a particular haunted location or place that you would like to investigate? And like, there's no money is not an option. We can fly you anywhere in the world, but if you had the choice, where would you go? Oh, there are two places. There are two. I can't give you just one. No, that's okay. Um, give us both. Mm -hmm. The first one would be the Tower of London. Oh um, yes. Yes, that, that would be, be that. There's no way anyone's getting in within a 5k radius of that place to, for that reason, because obviously it's still being owned by the crown and the jewels and all that sort of stuff that's there. It's just so historically significant, but I reckon it would have some stories to tell. Oh, <laughs> just the, the, the missing brothers and just all sorts of you know so much history so much written and recorded history there you know it's not all, like you have to really dig around to find it yeah yeah all, that's it yeah all the beheadings <laughs> oh that's exactly yeah. i mean how, exactly do are we going to pick up a, a you know an entity that hasn't has missed its head you know like will it appear mm -hmm. as missing it's in like just just touching the iceberg here and like, it's just yeah, crazy. it would be I can definitely, con I would love to come on that investigation if you ever organise it. Oh, <laughs> where's the other? <laughs> and where, where's the other? The Great Pyramids. Oh, in Giza? Yep. Yeah. That in would... Egypt, I would have to, I, I, I would love to know whether or not, you know, because it's such monuments, uh, you know, people obviously assume you know, just purely directly to, to the dead. But is there anything that's still around, you know, from just, oh, my God, you know, is, is anything from a, from an audible perspective? Will it come through, you know, in, in ancient Egyptian language? Like it just, you know, so many things, to, avenues to explore about the possibility of an afterlife. But from such an ancient culture of written culture that we know of here on Earth. Go and investigate and take a team of investigators with me would be Stonehenge. Oh, yes. Yes. I've I mean, been to Stonehenge. Oh, Yes. Because the energy, that's, you know how we, um, Scorpio was talking about ley lines earlier, mm -hmm. the, the ley line energy alone in that is just off the, off the Richter scale. And to actually do an investigation there, because remember, they, I mean, one of the stones is a slaughter stone. So they used to make actual sacrifices there on each of the solstices, the winter and the summer solstice. And there's eight Sabbaths they used to practice there too. So I, mm -hmm. I can just imagine, I mean, that, just imagine the kind of 
you know, entities that might still be roaming around. So I'd like to go, like, just like you going to Giza, I think, yeah, the more historic, the, the, mm. the better the investigation would be. Beth, in, in respect to spirit boxes, are these still as controversial as they were when they were first introduced? Do you, do you think they actually work? Oh, that's uh, the cause. Their their origins were, you know, due to you know, sort of ITC into trans. trans oh, I never get the terminology into transdimensional <laughs> communication. There we go. Got it out. Um, I I. It's hard with ghost boxes and frank boxes, as you, as they also are termed as well. Um, I know what their original um, use was. It wasn't through um, flicking through radio channels. It was just white noise through a radio. Um, but what we use as investigators is a, you know, and it goes through. Um, I've, I've heard some interesting audio recorded that's you know it's it's interesting it's i wouldn't say it's paranormal but it does err on a very high chance of coincidence to the to the answer to the question that people are asking but we really yes. are up for audible pareidolia like it is just so we are so listening for an answer that anything that comes out you just don't know um that's why i recommend a lot of people um, record the audio of these and listen back because then you're going to be less intent i think when you're there in the moment you're more than likely going to hear something if it's not um a lot of people these days will use um, what we call Faraday cages. So they'll actually put the um, recorder in something that will block out any radio signals. So you will only get that, but no uh, radio um, station feed come through. You won't hear any voices unless it's actually something that is trying to communicate with you. So a lot of people trying to make modifications in that way to, to eliminate that possible audible pareidolia. Well, I've, I've actually been in the situation where I'd been, we'd been in a group surrounding, probably a group of about 15 people, and they're surrounding the spirit box in the centre in a room, and everybody's hearing all these words, and I'm not getting it. I'm, I'm, I'm the one kind of going, Did, I don't think that was a yes. Or mm. I, I don't think that's. Have you been in? Have you been in that situation too? And I've just been <sighs> thinking maybe there's something wrong with my hearing because everybody uh, else is like, you know, it's. <laughs> I'm the, I'm exactly the same. I'm. I'm sitting there going, Did you hear? It said Chris, and I thought, no, I thought it said that. Actually, no, I just thought it was the sound. You know, I, it goes. That's for. That's for me. I, it goes right over my head. Some people are really into it where they can. Yeah, find yeah. words in stuff that's just i mean i'm hearing something completely different it really is up to you know how your brain is wired to hearing sound we all have different accents we've all grown up with you know like it's all this coming into play as well and i just, yeah i'm the same i'm like oh, i've got no idea what was said yeah i've really I've, that's happened to, in two different investigations and i'm i'm that's kind of when I, they lose me. It's kind of like, mm. oh, I'm not sure about this. You know, this sounds like it's being forced. And, yeah. you know, I'd, ra I'd rather just go in and, like like you said, with little equipment and just see if I feel stuff. And, you know, you know if somewhere, you know, when you walk into a place, if the temperature changes drastically, I think you know straight away that um, something's not right there or there's somebody else with you in the room. You know, you have that sixth sense. Or is it a sixth sense or is it, yeah. I suppose it, it's a good way of describing it, I suppose, better than most. Well, that's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening and remember... If you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.